Hello, and welcome to this presentation on integrated powertrain control with Maple and MapleSim, optimal engine operating points. Let us begin with, with an overview of this presentation. First, we will introduce the two components that are used throughout this entire presentation. The first is the brake specific fuel consumption. The second is the mean value engine model. Then we will look at optimization using the parameter sweep tool and determining the engine optimal operating point followed by simulation with those optimal operating points in our powertrain, where we will see implementation of the brake-specific fuel consumption and examine how the engine works with a city cycle drive cycle. Throughout this presentation, the objective would be to determine the optimal operating point for an internal combustion engine based on the idea of the brake-specific fuel consumption, BSFC. The brake specific fuel consumption is an effective measure of engine performance. This is determined by the instantaneous fuel rate divided by the instantaneous engine power. This approach can also be extended by including information such as emission data. However, throughout this presentation, we will only focus on the BSFC approach. The engine map shown here illustrates the contour lines from the brake specific fuel consumption analysis and the ISO power lines. Additionally, example engine operating performance indicated by the blue and green dots are shown. These dots comprise the instantaneous speed and torque that the engine is running at. If we can determine the BSFC and power requirements for a given engine, we can then relate those two to determine what the desired optimal operating points are. In the example shown, the optimal points are illustrated by the green dots as they converge to the optimal curve provided by the black line. This line indicates the predetermined optimal range for the engine given a large variation in power requirements. Therefore, in order to make the engine run with the best BFFC response, we will need a powertrain that will allow the engine operating points to move towards the desired optimal line. This is illustrated by the green arrows. Next is the mean value engine model, which is based off of previous work developed. The mean value engine model is a physics-based model that determines the overall power output and doesn't examine the details of the cycle-by-cycle -cycle power output. Rather, it looks at the overall response, or mean behavior of the engine. The model includes simplified gas flow that allows for information that includes fuel consumption to be displayed or provided. By combining the information of the BSFC and mean value engine model, we can use Maple and MapleSim as a virtual dynamometer. Let's take a look. Here I've opened up the mean value engine model configured as a virtual dynamometer. In the middle is the internal combustion engine that is the mean value engine model. On the right hand side, we can see the load, which is provided by a torque driver and is ramped up over time. On the right is a throttle controller based off of the desired throttle angle and is adjusted over time depending on the load that is provided to the engine. Below we can see the mean value engine outputs information that includes fuel consumption and power information that is used to calculate the BSFC information for this engine. This model has been configured to allow for engine parameters and dynamometer parameters. When we adjust the parameters in the dynamometer section, we can see the different values for desired RPM and desired torque. These are the target values for this particular test. If I run the model, you can see the results appear on screen. Here are the results of the dyno test with the presets of 2000 RPM and 200 Newton meters torque. We can see that the engine torque has reached the 200 Newton meter value. Additionally, we can see that the engine was able to run stably at the desired level of 2000 RPM. The throttle shown here in green stabilized with approximately 20 degree angle. The throttle was adjusted automatically through the controller in the model on the left hand side shown here to enable the desired speed to actually occur. The BSFC and power of the engine were both 
able to stabilize at final values within the time allotted for the simulation. Now that we have a virtual dynamometer that is able to run our mean value engine model at the desired speed and torque values, we can easily change the different operating points by changing, for instance, the operating speed or the operating torque. Doing this manually will be very labor intensive and not really provide any additional value. However, if we use a Maple worksheet, we can do this automatically and taking advantage of parallel computing to do it very quickly and effectively. Let's take a look at how we can do that. I'm going to open up my attached worksheet to this model. The objective of this worksheet is to be able to run those simulations several times over where we are able to take the final values when the engine comes to equilibrium and obtain a steady state engine map that defines the BSFC. We start by the initial setup. First, we need to go and connect our MapleSim worksheet to the MapleSim model as shown here in the window above. Next, we obtain the default parameters from our MapleSim model, which are just the parameters that are already specified in the parameter block for our dynamometer. Then, we compile the model so that way we can run it optimally with our parameter sweep command. By using the compile command, the MapleSim model is condensed into the highly efficient pre-processed code that is simply used time and time again with the parameter sweep. Now that we have a compiled form of our model, let's take a look at what happens when we run the compiled code itself. In this case, what I've done is I've ran our compiled program using the parameters of the default values, which in this case is setting the engine to run at 3000 RPM with a torque of 250 Newton meters. What the output provided is a matrix of 350 rows by seven columns. I can open this up and just take a look at the data. The first column shows all the time information, while the remaining six columns shows the different probe information. These probed information can be seen as a list of probe names here. For instance, the BSFC information is provided, as well as the engine power, speed, torque, fuel flow rate, and throttle valve angle. Now that we have our probed information that we want and the ability to run our model with the compiled form by specifying the different desired RPMs and torque, we can take a look at how this can be played out with their parameter sweep. Here is the parameter sweep command where we specify our RPM from 1000 to 6000 RPM, our desired torque from 50 newton meters to 400 newton meters. In this case, each range of data is distributed evenly over 26 data points. Therefore, the, the parameter sweep will run 26 by 26 simulations. That will result in over that will result in 676 data points that were generated in just a few seconds, and we can confirm that with our number of elements that were generated here. We can also see the distribution of those data points when we check the engine speed and torque values that were set. We notice here that the engine speed and the engine torque were evenly distributed with those 26 distribution points. Now let's take a look at the resulting uh, data points that come from our simulation. Uh, in this section I've put together the analysis that provides the overall graphs for the different BSFC curve. I've provided two BSFC curves, one that takes the raw information from the simulation and the other that I've pre-prepared for optimization. You'll notice that there's a definitive edge for this optimization curve. That edge is the result of the wide open throttle position of the engine, which we can see here when we do a contour plot. The blue line is the wide open throttle position where the engine has reached the limit of what it is capable of doing. We notice in the BSFC data that's raw from the simulation that there are unstable responses in very large peaks and valleys. So instead, when we prepare it for optimization, we provide it with a high penalty, in this case of 1,000, compared to the rest of the range, which is only in the 
140 to 280 range. Now that we have the BSFC with the high cost penalty for values that are outside the range that the engine is stable for, we can define power levels that we will be using for the optimization process. Here, we can specify power levels that we're interested in. In this case, I'm using 15 to 185 kilowatts in increments of 10 kilowatts. Here I can define a cost function using engine speed and engine power as my inputs. This cost function will be used to calculate the minimum BSFC and allowing the torque information to be calculated by the relationship of power and speed of the engine. This optimization process is using the global optimization solver. This ensures that the resulting optimization is optimal over a large range where we can see that there could be multiple crossing points of our BSFC curve and compare those with the power levels. Let's take a look at the resulting plots. Here we can see in gray the optimal operating line, OOL. This line has been produced based on the combination of the lowest operating points of the BSFC for the different power levels. For instance, at this power level we can see that there are multiple crossings of our BSFC line. The value that we want is the lowest crossing or the lowest point for this power consumption out of all the points that the engine is actually capable of reaching. Notice that this point is also within the valid range of our test data. We want to make sure that any optimal values that are determined by the global optimization solver are within the useful range for our system. This process of maintaining the range of operating conditions was defined by how the global optimization process is calculated. First, the global optimization will determine the power level by selecting one of the power levels within our, our range of data that we've already pre-selected for instance, the line that I've clicked on. Then, it will sequentially move along the line until it can find the local minima. The global optimization process will ensure that the local minima isn't the stopping point of the optimization and that it will continue looking for any other local minima until it can converge to the global minimum point. In cases where the optimization process goes beyond the range, in this case 6,000 RPM for this power level, there is a large cost penalty that includes an offset like we did before with 1000 BSFC value. Remembering that we're trying to go and minimize the cost. So this high BSFC value is a large penalty. There is also an included factor of the distance from the center of our map to how far away the optimization process is. This will ensure that the global optimization process will reconverge into the valid range if it exceeds either the 4000 newton meter limit on one end or the 6000 RPM limit on the other. And remember that any data points that are above the wide open throttle position are already given a high cost value to make sure that the BSFC optimization process doesn't result in any values that are beyond the wide open throttle point the engine. At this point, we've already determined the globally optimized operating point for the engine, so we're done, right? Well, the problem is, is in ranges such as this point here, there's a significant jump in engine torque with very little gain in the BSFC value. This resulting behavior isn't ideal for applications where the engine is trying to be controlled. Instead, what we'd ideally want is a fairly smooth, transitional, optimal operating line for the engine to work with. One way of doing that is to fit a polynomial spline or polynomial curve to this optimal data set that we've just determined. So let's consider in the last step the polynomial approximation of our optimal data points. We can see here that, for instance, this fifth order polynomial, we can easily fit the data to it by using the nonlinear curve fitting tool where we simply extract the engine speed data, the engine torque data of our 
optimal curve, define it with the polynomial that we just created and allowing it to be a function of, in this case, x. Here, the resulting equation is given to us. This equation now allows us to relate the engine speed, which is our input x, to the output torque, which would be provided out. When we combine these plots together, we can see that this polynomial fit does a good job of approximating our, our optimal operating points throughout the entire range. Here, there's noticeable differences in the optimal line and the approximation. However, the difference in BSFC values is fairly minimal. So the engine is actually able to maintain a very smooth response with very little difference in overall fuel consumption or desired performance. The next step will be to implement a controller that allows the engine to operate at some point along this line, depending on the different power levels that the engine is expected to run at. As a result, when the engine is desired to run at a particular power level, at any of these crossing points for instance, or in fact anywhere along this curve, the engine operating point will be pushed or converged to the desired curve that we see here. Returning to our PowerPoint slide, we can examine this in one of our control strategies. Here we can see a powertrain control block diagram that illustrates an example of how we can control the optimal operating point for an engine. The idea behind this powertrain control is to allow the engine to actually operate at those points along the curve. The overall approach allows a power flow in the engine control strategy where information such as the desired vehicle speed versus the actual vehicle speed is provided to an input interpreter. This interpreter then in turn outputs the expected engine power or the power demand on the powertrain. This power now can be related via the function that we calculated with the speed and the torque. Here we can see that the overall equation now is just an engine speed relationship given that our function f of n is a function to calculate what the actual torque would be for that desired power level. This information can then be passed down the chain where engine throttle control and transmission control can help regulate the desired operating point for the engine. As a result, the overall powertrain can then output to the vehicle performance and that can be inferred as the vehicle speed that gets translated back to the master controller as the input for this entire block diagram. Now let's take a look at how this is implemented in a model where the optimal operating point of the engine is actually provided in a simulation with a city cycle drive cycle. This new model contains the same mean value engine model that we used before to calculate what the optimal operating point of the engine is. Here we've now implemented it in a powertrain configuration where the engine located in the center here drives a continuously variable transmission, CVT, with a final gear ratio to the wheels. We include the vehicle dynamics for longitudinal vehicle dynamic loading. Here we can see that the overall block diagram that we talked about previously is implemented as the control strategy for this model. The first PID component here is like the input interpreter of our block in the block diagram. Information on the vehicle speed as a desired performance and the actual measured vehicle speed coming from our longitudinal vehicle dynamics are compared and the desired operating power is calculated and provided down the chain. Next is the engine optimal operating point calculation where the information on the desired torque and the desired engine speed is calculated. Those points are simply calculated from the optimal operating curve that we had talked about previously where the curve fit is implemented. The information on the desired torque is passed to the engine throttle control. The engine throttle control is what is being used to maintain the desired engine operating torque. That information is also coupled with a minimum engine speed 
which we'll discuss momentarily. The engine speed that is desired from our calculation is then passed to, to the transmission control, as seen here, where the transmission controls the CVT behavior, allowing the engine to operate through the combination of throttle control and transmission control to the desired set point. As mentioned, there is a minimum operating speed for the engine, that is, in this case, 1000 RPM is maintained to prevent the engine from going into a stall. The throttle control is provided with that minimum engine speed information and will regulate the throttle if the loading becomes too heavy and the throttle is capable of providing that minimum operating speed. Otherwise, the block diagram is implemented throughout this model pretty well as it was described. Let us examine the results of this model by running a worksheet which is attached to the model itself. This presentation has this worksheet pre-configured for it. First, we begin by linking to the model just as we did previously. Next, we'll run the simulation by telling the model to simulate based off of the desired parameters. In this case, I'm going to begin by having the road angle start at zero degrees. Just as we saw in our previous worksheet, a matrix is returned from our simulation analysis. When we expand the next section in our worksheet, we can run our plot result code to provide us with these four top plots. We'll begin by examining the desired vehicle velocity versus the measured vehicle velocity. We can notice that throughout the 600 second simulation, the vehicle is able to track the desired velocity quite nicely as it maintains the velocity profile during the stop and starts. Next, when we take a look at the engine performance characteristics, we can see here that the maximum engine power consumption is no greater than 30 kilowatts, and that in general, the engine power is tracked quite nicely. When we zoom in on some of these peaks, we can see that the larger power consumption values are tracked extremely well. However, when we get below five kilowatts, the engine power tracking isn't as accurate we can see the results of this transfer from how our engine RPM and our torque are combined. Notice how the engine torque is tracked quite nicely with some minor discrepancies in the related area where there's low power. Additionally, when we look at the engine speed, we can see that the majority of the time the engine's actually held at 1000 RPM, which is our minimum engine speed. Next, if we plot our engine operating points on our BSFC map, we can see here in our green diamonds that the engine points are placed along the 1000 RPM line, maintaining that the engine will not go below this speed. And then when engine power demand increases, the operating point of the engine traverses along the optimal operating line that we have pre-calculated. Similarly, we have provided a baseline engine comparison as seen here in the yellow stars. These yellow stars come from the same engine model running with an automatic transmission. We can see significant distribution of operating points with this approach. The engine in this case was not optimized for the optimal BSFC and as a result we can see significant scattering compared to where we would ideally like the engine to operate. Let us consider the next option, which would be to increase the power demand. One way of doing that is to significantly increase the road inclination angle. In this case, I'll increase the angle to 15 degrees and run that simulation. Again, we're returned with a matrix of our overall results. I'll run my predefined code that will provide the plot results starting with the same four plots as before, where we have our desired vehicle velocity versus the measured one, we can notice that the vehicle isn't tracking as accurately as previously, while the engine and 
powertrain struggle to maintain ideal tracking. The increased power demand while the vehicle is traveling up this constant inclination and stopping and going as our overall New York City cycle demands from it, we can see that there are some minor discrepancies, but in general the tracking is fairly reasonable. Next, when we take a look at the engine power comparison, we see here significantly higher power usage, up to 70 kilowatts in this case. The engine maintains reasonable tracking with the desired versus measured power performance. Likewise, we can see that the torque and speed are also in comparable performance. But more interestingly, we can see here, now with the increased power demand on our powertrain, the engine operating points significantly traversed along the optimal operating line. With the engine RPM reaching nearly 3000 RPM and operating still with a minimum speed of 1000 RPM. Again, our baseline comparison with the automatic transmission and the same engine has been provided. We can notice that the distribution is moving towards our optimal BSFC, but not with the same purpose or intent as our control approach that we've actually designed into it. While it may be possible for better engine tracking or vehicle velocity tracking from our vehicle model, this model is just designed to provide an example of what can be done with the BSFC optimal engine performance characteristics. We simply reuse the same controller as before and increase the power demand on our drive cycle. This provides us with a general comparison. However, improvements could be made in either model. Let us go back to our slides for some concluding thoughts. In conclusion, we were able to provide an optimized engine model based on BSFC performance characteristics. Then we defined a smooth approximation for that optimization of the BSFC, implemented a control approach with the powertrain and used that optimization for the objective to drive the engine. Then we were able to observe that excellent engine performance using our optimized powertrain and even varied the power demand on our overall powertrain. And we can see excellent tracking still maintained despite changing any of the controller or master controller performances. Lastly, all this was done using Maple and Maple Sim in one combined package. This presentation is intended to highlight some of the technical challenges that were overcome using Maple and Maple Sim. To find out more about this presentation or to learn more about the products, please contact us using the information shown on the screen. Thank you.